In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The theme that has been selected is the birth of the Savior, who is the Word made flesh. As we reflect on this theme, I'm going to take you away from the well-known stories of Joseph and Mary traveling to Bethlehem, of Jesus being born in a manger, and the angels appearing to the shepherds and leading the shepherds to the manger, and the star appearing in the sky and leading the wise men to the baby Jesus. What I want us to do this evening is to become reflective, perhaps philosophical, to understand what is the significance of this story. Perhaps you and I as humans living on earth, time and again, feel a vacuum in life, a vacuum that desires to be filled, filled with the truth, the reality that is behind all existence. And as we seek the truth and reality behind all existence, we may call this truth God. And we are seeking God. And we wonder that when we look at our world, our world with all its challenges and difficulties, our world with its COVID problem, our world with its floods, and earthquakes, and tsunamis, our world with its nuclear weapons, and instances of war all over, a world in which there is so much of evil happening, women being raped, refugees and migrants at the mercy of their tormentors. In this world, in this world, will ever God come to us? Will ever God become a human being in our midst? Will we have God coming to save us from this kind of a world in which we live? The theme, as we said, is the birth of a Savior who is the Word made flesh. Greek philosophers around the time of Jesus, some of them before, some of them contemporary, and some of them later, Greek philosophers of the time struggled with this question. Will God ever come to the world? Will God become a human being? And Greek philosophers said, this is impossible. God can never take on a human body. And why? The Greek philosopher said, because the body is an evil prison house, an evil prison house in which the soul is shackled. The body is a prison in which the soul is tied up. The body is a tomb in which the spirit of humans is confined. In fact, a first century philosopher who was born just after Jesus died and resurrected, his name is Plutarch. Plutarch said, it is nothing less than blasphemy to say that God involves in the affairs of the world. 
It is nothing less than blasphemy for God to be engaged with the world. The great Roman Stoic Emperor Mar Marcus Aurelius Marcus Aurelius lived in the second century. He despised the body in comparison with the spirit. And he said, the composition of the whole body is under corruption. The body. There was one Greek word for this body called sarx. Sarx literally translated as flesh. And our theme says, the Savior who is the Word made flesh. So, Sarx, flesh, in its basic meaning, what Sarx meant was all that material that covers the bones of an animal or a human being. All the material that covers the bones whether it's your heart, whether it's your lungs, whether it's your digestive tract, whether it's your muscles, whether it's your blood vessels, whether it's your skin, all this covers the bones and that is sarx. And this sarx, this flesh is perishable. This sarx, this flesh is subject to sickness, to suffering and death. But as time evolved, this word sarx did not just mean literal flesh, it meant the whole human body. And then as people reflected on the human body with its suffering, its temptations and problems, they said, this sarx, this flesh is human nature in all its weaknesses, its lusts, its cravings, its selfishness, its wickedness. So if Sark's flesh is human nature with its weaknesses, its lusts, its cravings, its selfishness, its wickedness, how can God become flesh? How can the word become flesh? If ever, this is what Greek philosophers said, if ever God were to come to earth as a human being, that God would just be a phantom, an apparition, appearing to be human, but not really human. It's interesting that in an old Hindu tradition, it is said that when an avatar walks on earth, the feet of the avatar do not touch the ground because it's only an avatar. It's a descent. It's a manifestation. It's an apparition. But it is not human being. And even when the avatar comes, the avatar retains divinity. Outward form is human, but inner form is divine. So it is never human in its totality. And so, this was shattering news when John writes in this gospel, the word became flesh. This is something unthinkable that God could enter into this life which we live. That eternity could appear in time and that human eyes could actually see God. The word becoming flesh. Now when you go through the Greek in which the New Testament is written, it says the logos word, logos became a human being. Now what was logos? We go way back to the 6th century BC, there was this Greek philosopher called Heraclitus. Heraclitus said, all existence is in a constant state of flux. And he gave us that important proverb, 
you never enter the same river twice. If you enter a river today, that water would have flowed wrong. And tomorrow if you enter that river, it's fresh water. You never enter the same river twice. But when everything is in a state of flux, how come there is order in this state of flux? And Heraclitus said, the order comes from Logos. Logos was that divine reasoning principle. Logos was the divine creative power that held the world together. The Stoic philosophers after Heraclitus also said the same thing. What is Logos? Logos is the power that keeps the world in order. Logos is the power that keeps the world going. Not only the Greeks, even the Jews had a concept of Logos. Logos which means word. And in fact, the Jewish concept of word goes prior to the Greek philosophy of Logos. It's evident right there in Genesis chapter 1 when we have the story of creation. It says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And then when you read the third verse, it says, And God said, Let there be light. God said, Let there be light. And there was light. The power of the spoken word. And if you go through the first chapter of the book of Genesis, again and again it is said, And God said, Let there be trees, vegetation. And so it was. God said, let there be animals. And so it was. So the power of the spoken word. In fact, in the Bible, you notice in Isaiah chapter 55 verse 11, this is what God says. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish the purpose which I have planned for it. The word goes forth from the mouth of God to accomplish its purpose. And this word is now becoming flesh to accomplish purpose. John chapter 1 begins with these words. In the beginning was the word, that means Logos. In the beginning was the Logos, and the Logos was with God, and the Logos was God. As I said earlier, Logos is that reasoning principle. Logos is that creative force. Logos is that consciousness within God. Now we are talking about philosophy. And if you look at Indian philosophy, Indian philosophy also talks about the ultimate reality having chit, consciousness. And it is now this consciousness that is coming down to earth. Indian philosophy also says the ultimate reality is beyond understanding and comprehension. It is Nirguna Brahman. But this Nirguna Brahman becomes Saguna Brahman and comes down to earth. So it is this Logos, this Chit of Satchitananda, Sat, God exists, the Father, Chit, the consciousness of God, Christ, and Anand, the bliss of God, the Holy Spirit. So it is this Chit that is now coming down in human form, being human. And it is not just an apparition. This is that, that you know, shocking realization that God becomes human, literally human, human life with all its 
vulnerabilities, its suffering, its pain, its sickness, its challenges, temptations. God in Christ becomes that human like you and me. It's very striking if you look at Hebrews chapter 2 verses 14 and 15. There it is written, Since therefore the children, children means human beings, since therefore the human beings share flesh and blood, he, he means Jesus, he himself likewise shared the same things. Human beings share flesh and blood. Jesus shares the same things, flesh and blood, so that through death he might destroy the one who has power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all live their lives, who have lived their lives in slavery by the fear of death. So here you notice the writer to the Hebrews saying, just as we human beings are flesh and blood, the Christ becomes a human, Jesus of Nazareth. And that Jesus of Nazareth is also flesh and blood. But then this flesh and blood is different. This Jesus lives a sinless life. This Jesus does not allow the world to control his flesh. Rather, he allows divinity to direct his life. And so, in becoming human, this word liberates humans from the shackles of sin and ignorance about God. When the word takes on our human form, the power of the divine being having lived a sinless life delivers us from the bondage to sin and the ignorance that we have about God. And that is why in John chapter 1 verse 14 it is said, and the word became flesh and lived among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. Full of grace and truth. So grace, the grace of forgiveness. Truth making us realize the reality of God. Now, giving us liberation, what does it imply? 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 21 in the Bible, we have this verse where Paul says, for our sake, God made Jesus to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Now, this kind of language, uh, if taken literally, causes confusion. What it means is, for our sake, God made Jesus to bear the consequences of sin. For our sake, God made Jesus to bear that, if we were to talk in another legal language, to bear the penalty which we should bear for our sin. But I'm using a general term. God made Jesus to bear the consequences of our sinful nature, our self-centered nature, our worldly nature. And what is the consequence of sin? The consequence of sin, of course, literally put in Romans uh, 6.23, uh, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. 
the consequences of sin, wages of sin is death. So what is the consequence of sin? It is the extinguishing of the sin-stained soul from the holy being of God. Extinguishing. It is finishing off. Finishing off your existence from the very existence of God. You have no place within the being of God. We, of course, talk it in different languages. We call that hell. And hell has all its uh, different pictures. But philosophically, what is this hell? It's a complete cutting off of your life from the being of God. And so, for our sake, God made Jesus to suffer the consequences of sin, though he knew no sin. He was sinless, but God made him suffer the consequences of sin. And what does that mean? Consequences of sin? Spiritual death. Spiritual death where your life finishes. There is no more of you. God in Jesus experiences death. The giver of life experiences death from the being of God. And therefore that cry on the cross of Jesus, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So for our sake, God made him to be sin who knew no sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. So this is what it is. We might become the righteousness of God. You look at first uh, John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. There the writer says, To all those who received him, to them gave he power to become the children of God. Not of blood, not of the will of flesh, or of the will of humans, but of God. It's a new life, a new life, not a life of the flesh. So that is what he says. Children of God who are born not of the blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of humans, but of God. And that is that good news that we are saying. The birth of a savior who is word become flesh. The word become flesh delivers us from the shackles of human existence from sin, from the karma of life to freedom. That is that good news we celebrate. And then it's not only freedom from sin, but also freedom from ignorance of, about God. John 1.18, no one has seen God. No one has seen God. It is only the Son who is in the bosom of the Father who has made him known. What is truth? Truth is God. And no one has seen God, but we have beheld God in and through Jesus on earth. And so this becomes that good news that we are celebrating. Word becoming flesh who is a savior. And so, that invitation in the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 4, verses 15 and 16. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. My friends, this evening, that is the good news. Word become flesh which saves us. So let us approach the throne of grace with boldness 
so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And all those who believe in him, to them gives he power to become children of God. Amen.